Hi, I'm Dave Pasley. I'm a NAPC engineer and a former RoboBoat team lead uh, from UCF Robotics Club uh, in 2015. And right now I'm going to touch on a very important concept that I'm sure has been beat into your heads uh, the whole time, and it's, uh, it's safety. So I know that, that you've probably been lectured on safety a lot of times, uh, but what I'm going to cover in this lecture is very specific to RoboBoat. So, um, if you check out the slideshow, you'll see a lot of examples of bad safety throughout the whole thing, and I'll <laughs> no need for me to point those out. Uh, so these are the basic requirements. If you read the rules, uh, I'm sure all of you have read them from, from the front to the back and know them word for word. You'll know that this is required of you. Uh, a three or four point harness for deploying your crane, a tow rope harness for retrieving the platform by kayak, a uh, trailer for transporting your platform on land, you can't just be carrying it around by hand, and an e-stop button and a remote kill switch and uh, everything else that's on this slide here. <laughs> so the lifting harness is uh, one of the things that we see a lot, of, a lot of the teams having a problem with. And basically, we're hoping that you've installed eye bolts on the most, uh, on the strongest part of your platform and uh, and that you have built a lifting harness that will not fall apart <laughs> and fail. Uh, and this is really for the safety of your people and so that you don't break your boat on the docking platform. So I'm just going to go ahead and build one of these real quick to give you an example. So I have a couple of pieces of rope. We're going to guess that, you, that uh, the boat that I'm going to lift weighs, I don't know, 10 pounds. Not even, that's it's like two pounds, I don't know. So I know that this rope will carry our platform. It's a marine rope. So these two pieces of rope are the same length. And I have these five carabiners to use for this. So the first thing I'm gonna do is tie a loop in the middle of this thing that we're going to lift from. It's very easy. You just <laughs> tie a knot. A nice, strong knot. You pull it tight. You make sure it's not going to slip. So. Some of the knots that won't come undone are listed here on the slide, a bowline, a noose, a double figure eight. What I've done is a figure eight. Now, we're gonna go ahead and tie knots on the ends of these four ropes. But this time, I'm gonna tie bowlines. Well, yeah. a different one. What I'm actually tying is a knot that we can adjust so that we can adjust the lengths of each of our four straps. So now we have these adjustable length cords hanging off. We can take and stick our strongest carabiner here on the top. And one carabiner each on the sides. And there we have a lift harness. Ah, oh, but wait, they're not all the right lengths. That's why we tied that knot. We can adjust them. There it is. 
Let's see if it works. There we have it, a safe, even lifting harness <laughs> in just a few minutes. And that's an example of a good lifting harness. Now you also need a tow rope and a harness for that, which is just as easy to make. And it should be on the front of your boat or uh, in, a, in a normal direction of motion for your boat so that when the kayaker, uh, you know, when, you're, when your boat's dead in the water and the kayaker comes up and grabs it and attaches it to a cord and starts taking off with it, he doesn't swamp your boat. So it should be in a, in a direction that your boat uh, is supposed to move in. Make sure that it's clear of any, uh, of any fragile parts on your boat. You don't want, you don't want the kayaker to, to connect it to the tow rope and pull it and pull off your you know, $10,000 Velodyne LiDAR. Uh, and you also want to keep it away from your boat's motors so that it doesn't get tangled in them. Now make sure it's easy to see and reach because it's, it's a, you know, the kayaker's gonna have to reach out of a kayak and grab this thing and they're gonna have to see it. Otherwise, they're just gonna grab the boat wherever they can and attach the rope to it and pull it just however they're, they're able to. Uh, you also need to have a boat trailer. There, you can just get a wagon, much like this one here. A commercial, off the shelf wagon. It's strong, it'll hold your boat, it's got a nice rigid handle so that you can maneuver it forward, backwards, and nobody will complain about this. And then you can outfit it with whatever you need in order to hold your boat uh, the way that you want it to. Uh, just remember, you know, if you look at this, this trailer, can you see the ground? So you look at this trailer and uh, it's got nice all-terrain wheels on it because you're going to have to pull it through mud, gravel, grass, mulch, and what have you. And uh, you can see also that it's, that it's less than three feet wide. So this guy will easily fit through uh, a regular doorway. Now your boat, it's required that you have an e-stop button. Um, this e-stop button should be very visible for the kayaker. The kayaker is going to be the one who's touching it. This is about an inch and a half uh, in diameter. And, uh, and it needs to be very accessible so that they can easily hit the e-stop button. And it needs to mechanically disconnect power from the motors. There needs to be... It, there needs to be no way for the power to accidentally get to the motors and, and start them going. And uh, we prefer that you have a two-step reset mechanism because we don't want them to hit the e-stop, have it stop, and then they accidentally bump the button with their elbow and it starts back up again. So a uh, two-step reset is preferred, like twist and pull. These can be found uh, very easily with a right Google search. Uh, your remote kill switch also needs to, uh, you know, do the same thing, disconnect power from the motors mechanically. It needs to not rely on software. It needs to fail safe so that if you lose comms with your remote kill switch, it, it uh, automatically cuts off. And, uh, yeah, there's a heartbeat base. There's, there's lots of things that you can buy off the shelf that'll work uh, the way that we want them to. Um, you know, some, you can get one with a dedicated remote or you can get the RC and connect it up to your uh, RC controller. Uh, but the main thing is that it needs to not be software based and it needs to fail to safe. Your, if you have any moving parts on your boat, which everybody does, they have propellers, you know, I don't, I didn't see any sailboats here. Um, you need to have shrouds on them, uh, you know, reasonably. If you have, have an arm that comes up or something like that, it might be hard to shroud that, but, you know, definitely have shrouds around your motors. 
And uh, if you have any sharp edges or points on your boat, hopefully you don't, but if you do, please cover them up or remove them. Um, <laughs> so you know where all this stuff is, but by the end of the week, you're gonna be so tired uh, that, that basically if anybody's gonna get hurt by this stuff, it's probably you. So keep that in mind, uh, you know, and, and cover this stuff up and, and uh, try to protect yourself for when you're running off of one hour of sleep and are not thinking clearly. So there's other stuff that, uh, that we worry about. Um, you know, you gotta run power to, to your area in the team tent. And uh, you know, a lot of you are using lithium batteries because they're you know, high energy density and they're efficient. And uh, I also wanna touch on the difference between compliance and actual safety. So powering your tent, one power strip per outlet. Don't daisy chain power strips. Uh, it's, that becomes an electrical hazard. And also remember, it's going to rain. There's going to be puddles on the ground. Don't put, you know, don't plug stuff in and, and have it laying on the ground because uh, it's likely going to end up in a puddle and either, you know, blow up your equipment or electrocute somebody. And please don't jury rig anything. Um, we don't want to see any bare wires hanging out. We don't want to see, you know, any, anything that basically presents a, a, a shock hazard. Uh, lithium batteries, so they're they're very easy to blow up. You know, uh, if you if they heat up, if they if you drain them too low, uh, please don't you know puncture them with with a with a knife. Don't hit them with a hammer. Uh, please charge them correctly. Don't you know store them in a water bucket or something weird like that. Um, and. and the exception to that is that if, uh, if your battery is puffed up and it becomes extremely hot, then it's probably going to, uh, you know, or it's in danger of exploding. And so you're going to want to put that in a LiPo bag and then in a quarantine area. And usually what that is is a bucket of salt water. So the reason I wanted to touch on safety versus compliance is because you need to understand the intent of this. We, um, we aren't telling you to do all this, uh, you know, just so that you're compliant, we actually want you to be safe. So, you know, safety compliance doesn't guarantee actual safety. We don't want you to be safety complacent. We want you to be safety conscious. Uh, so safety here is everyone's responsibility. A lot of the times we're very busy. We're not going to have time to, to come and, and, you know, check and make sure you're not doing anything, uh, you know, that could hurt you or, or someone around you or your, or your platform. So, you know, just pay attention, use common sense. Uh, if, if you think something might be a bad idea, if you have to think about it and wonder if it's a bad idea, then it probably is. Don't do it. Figure out uh, something that, that, uh, that is a better idea. Just think things through. And, uh, you know, that's, that's all I've got. <laughs>